the segregation in and of itself, though it is systematic and though the system promotes it because the more they can divide and conquer some of those old adages and basic concepts, you keep everyone divided and segregated, it's easier to control them. And a lot of times um, if you generate conflict amongst them, you keep their minds so distracted on self-improvement because self-improvement speaks against recidivism. Self-improvement speaks against the continuum and the continuation of a multi-billion dollar system. So if I could keep you focused on either watching television, fighting over televisions, fighting over a table to sit at, disputing with one another for racial reasons, then you look up and 10, 20, 30 years have gone by and you've done nothing to improve yourself. So you walk out the door, you're, you're scared and you don't know how to survive. And so you go back to your old survival tactics of selling drugs or doing whatever it is that landed you in prison. And then you just, it's a model that is sustainable as long as we're separated, right? Hi, you guys. Welcome back to our channel today. I am so excited. We have a few very very special guests with us here today. And I will allow them to introduce themselves only because I butcher his name every time I try to say it because I have a god awful accent. So I will let them introduce themselves. But we wanted to talk about how it's racially segregated inside of prison. I get this question constantly. I've gotten it since day one. People who don't have involvement with the prison system can't comprehend it. And they think that it's just so foreign and it's so wrong. And then also how, if people wanted to blur and be friends with people of different races and et cetera, how that works. And you three led the charge on that one. So we'll start with Keith. Why don't you introduce yourself and just hit the ground running? So my name is Keith James, also known as El Maestro. <laughs> <laughs> Should we all introduce ourselves or do you want me to just go into conversation on the let's, subject? Let's do intro first and okay. then take the lead. Your turn. My name is Arturo Cantu, uh, and I guess just to kind of give a little brief background, just uh, came home from a approximately 14 and a half year uh, prison sentence, and I've been home since 2017. Awesome. You want to introduce yourself? Do I get to introduce myself sure. as well? All right. I think everyone already knows me. I'm, you know, Mr. Clausen. I'm the other half of this incredible... Uh, dynamic duo here. And I've been home approximately 120 days now, four months, and wow. been trying to answer as many questions as possible. And this was an incredible opportunity to reconnect with two individuals who had an incredible influence on my life, on me becoming who I am today. And really, uh, many of the things that were instrumental in me ultimately winning my release and being here today. Awesome. So Keith, do you want to start? The floor is yours. Sure. And I think I'll add a little bit more content or narrative to, to my background. I uh, met both of these gentlemen um, in prison, or as Cantu likes to say, in college. Um, <laughs> but uh, similar to what Adam just had expressed, these two gentlemen were um, integral in me making a drastic change in my life and um, redirecting the trajectory of my life to be who I am today. I've been home, actually home home since uh, September 14th of this year. Uh, so yesterday made 90 days uh, that I've been home and I was away for um, eight years and some change. I'm not one of those eight years, um, three months, four weeks and uh, seven days type of guys, but eight years and some change on a 10 year sentence. Um, and these two guys, ironically, when I met them, it was a, um, a conversation that ensued with just the three of us. And it was these two guys who were sort of quizzing me to see if I was worthy to fit into a program that they had designed because they had had such a stringent standard on who they would permit to come into the program because they were trying to protect the integrity of the program. And the program was rooted around change, um, essentially, and trying to make a commitment to doing something different with our lives 
not just on a personal level, but doing it in a way where we made a commitment to assist each other in the process of change. And to um, be integral to the subject at hand, it was ironic that um, this little Mexican fella here and this white guy and this black guy became like the very best of inseparable friends. And um, in an environment where just as you said, it's hard for people to really understand and it's hard to uh, verbalize it, but there is an automatic implied definitive demarcation line of the races within this environment. And it's almost uh, taboo to the point of, um, a death wish, depending on the level of security, um, to connect on the type of level that we've connected on. Uh, and to be honest with you, to ask how we did that would really require us to almost sit here in conversation in retrospect and really explore that. Because it's interesting, but I, I don't know if I could just give you a direct answer. So I think it's going to take a bit of exploration from us all. I will say this, and it's one funny note. Um, and maybe this could segue us into the conversation. Oftentimes there were actual race wars. And there was one time in the actual um, medium security prison that the three of us were in where um, some black guys, it started with, I think it was some bloods, had gotten to a conflict with the Mexicans, right? Um, I think it was specifically the Pisces because even the Mexicans are broken down into fractions, right? Uh, factions, excuse me. Um, but then... Um, the, the, it turned it automatic that type of thing automatically becomes just racial because the majority of the bloods who were black guys were black and then when you know the mexicans and the blacks just started crashing it got really ugly and so we were discussing that one day and cantu and i were laughing i was like um hey cantu what, what would we ever do if the the blacks and the mexicans went to war and we sort of always had this this uh game plan like look we just gonna fight each other <laughs> we just <laughs> we're gonna fight each other and rumble with each other just give a good show and make people think we're really going at it and maybe nobody else would join in and that would be our way of sort of um, protecting ourselves. But in all reality, it was such a weird thing for the three of us because I didn't care if you were black, white, red, or yellow. If you ever did anything to any of these two guys, I was willing to lose my life to protect them. So um, I don't really know. I, how, how did we manage to uh, erase the demarcation line, guys? While you guys think about that, I just need to ask a clarifying question because I think there are people that are watching right now that either clicked off or they're gasping, like, this is 2020. What the hell are you talking about? We just went pre-Civil War. We just went all the way back. How dare this be a thing that we're discussing? And when you guys weren't home and I would just have to be like, well, it just is what it is. Like, that's just how it is in there. And I just, I don't have words to explain it. So I don't know if you guys have words to explain it, but like, why and how is this a thing? You could just briefly touch on that. I think I'll, I'll kind of jump in if you don't mind um, and just kind of explain it like this, right? Well, when you come into a, a high tension sort of, uh, I guess, situation, what becomes of it is everybody wants to know who's going to have who's back when it comes down to um, solving a problem or, uh, a, I guess, really who's, who's on whose side, right? And... and I guess within the federal system, it's delineated by a whole bunch of different uh, variables, right? There's the geographical location that kind of puts you in, in affiliation. Your gang kind of affiliates you, your race, uh, your color, um, even if you're uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> I guess, a darker complexion, you might be considered, a, you know, kind of a black race, right? Um, but at the end of the day, that's really what I believe comes down to. Everybody wants to know who to who's going to respond for a person that messes up because of course there's unwritten laws within institutions, right. That, um, we may or may not know about, uh, I guess with the audience here, but at the end of the day, you, you know, you are safer, if you will, right. With your own race. And that's kind of how it, it just has played out. Uh, it was a uh, system that was kind of developed, I guess, prior to our incarceration is not sure how it really, um, started of course we we know some of the uh hollywood movies kind of uh, let us know that california and the prisons there uh, and i and i've served some time in, in northern california where really you know the races are very segregated in that you have one line for 
for the blacks or anybody that's kind of has the blacks back or supporting that sort of, uh, of race and affiliates. And then there's the Mexicans and whites that, you know, go to the left side and the black side is the right side. And of course, uh, you don't go to the other side. If you go to the other side, there's, there's a reason you might be on that side. And of course, everyone's trying to figure that out and just because of the dynamic of prison and the situation. But um, I don't know for us and in, in kind of how we, I guess, tore through them barriers. I think it, it was really just, we were like-minded, right? We, we had all the same um, kind of objective in not only making ourselves better, but helping everybody else around us. And particularly the, the prison that we're at, the environment become better uh, just to help us live more comfortably and, and just kind of, uh, I guess, increase the quality of our life in, in the situation that we found ourselves in. But at the end of the day, uh, it was definitely a, a dynamic that you may, may or may not see again, or maybe have seen before. I don't know. I've never seen it in the time I was um, kind of uh, incarcerated. It, it was, it was, you don't eat, you don't eat with other people because of uh, how everybody else looked at you because of it. And we've, uh, us three kind of broke that barrier in, in the cafeteria kind of setting because there's, there's tables designated for your geographical location, your, your gang, whatever you may be affiliated with. And I've never seen anyone in uh, my, I guess, uh, stay within the Federal Bureau of Prisons that was able to sit with everybody. You know, three different races sitting with bloods or sitting with gangster disciples or sitting with Latin kings. You, you know, there, was, there wasn't anyone that I've ever seen do that. And um, I don't even know how to explain how it happened other than that we, everybody knew that we wanted to help uh, everyone become the best version of themselves. And, and they were open to that because, of course, everyone's trying to get to a better place while, while in that situation. So. Thank you for saying that, first of all, this was something that was pre-established before you got there, because uh, I think it's hard to explain, and I will never understand it, I've never been to prison, but prison is its own society that operates very, very differently than this outside world. So for you guys that are still with your jaws on the floor, they're really, I mean, that was the best way to explain it. And then just to clarify, so the three of you of three different races would sit at different times with different races and different geographical areas together, correct? So you were kind of blurring those lines. Just a question, going back to what Keith said earlier, did you ever fear your safety when you were in those situations? Because I know that things can turn really violent when it seems like you're, for lack of a better word, a traitor. I don't know how to word it, but did you guys ever fear that you would have to deal with some sort of repercussions for, for doing that? I'll start, I'll start with, for me, coming from uh, a penitentiary where things are very, very segregated. As uh, Gantu was, was saying, the higher the security level throughout the federal system, the more segregated it is. And depending where you go across the country, often further to the West Coast, it's more racially divided out there. This is, it's just how it is throughout the federal system. The, the breakdown racially, I believe is the result of, it's the same thing that we saw in society, you know, a hundred years ago, even years ago, where it's a means to control a population. Ultimately, that's what it comes down to. And when you put, when you condense individuals, crush them into a small area, which a prison is a city that's enclosed that you cannot move out of, and you have a scarcity of resources. There are a limited uh, number of televisions. There are a limited number of telephones, showers, all of these things that this limited space, just chairs, places to sit in the dining hall. And when you have a scarcity of resources, human nature is to protect those. And when you, in order to protect those, people gravitate towards their own race, their own geographic area, whoever is they associate themsel themselves with. And it's a matter of protection. For us, how those lines, in my opinion, how they really became blurred 
it was very intentional on our part. When we came together, and I'll speak for myself, I had great difficulty adjusting from spending a decade in a penitentiary, coming down to a medium where things were a little bit looser. The politics weren't as, as stringent. And for me, coming into a classroom with other individuals who were all about like exploring their own intelligence, doing introspective work on themselves, trying to find out who they were, and they were willing to share that with each other. Like me being brought into that atmosphere, I, I gotta admit, like at first was very, very difficult for me. I didn't wanna open up. I didn't wanna share with these people that I had built up all these walls, reasons to keep people at more than an arm's length. The, the prison politics of not crossing racial lines, of not sitting together interacting, in that classroom setting, all those were broken down. They were broken down by the individuals who are willing to share, express themselves, and to support one another. Feeling like I could be myself, express myself, and not be judged, and did not not see like political repercussions for that. For me, that was, it was a life-changing experience. And, you know, we kid around about it. These two like really had to force me to, to engage on a different level. You know, kids who always laugh when he used to go to embrace me, like, man, come here, bro. I'd be like, mm, I'd keep my elbow up. I needed physical space. Like it took me a long time to get used to just physically allowing people in. And as hard as that was for me to break that, like I always appreciated what he was doing and, and that he consistently put the effort in to break that down because I needed that. Can I clarify something you sure. said? Because just because I know you so well, it's not just to be 100% clear right now because we're talking about race and blurring those lines. Adam wasn't doing that because Cantu is Mexican. Adam was doing that because he had his wall up against everybody. Just yeah. want to make that very clear. Good, good clarity. Point. Good point. Good point. <laughs> he used to hug you in the visiting room like that. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Hi. I just want to add, I want to add one more thing here because ultimately it was coming into that classroom setting, building, establishing these relationships creating a safe space where we could express ourselves and support one another. Like that was the foundation for, for us really coming together. And the three of us just constantly pushed those boundaries. Like we stepped outside of the classroom and brought that to the compound. You know, first to like those spaces like the rec yard, which is a little bit more you know, uh, a little bit more open to then come to, as Cantu was saying, to the dining hall where it's very segregated and like all of the seats are accounted for. Like people, you know, it's hard to get a seat. And that's why there's, you know, like assigned sections and areas. So when the three of us would come in and, you know, decide, hey, where are we gonna go today? Who are we gonna go sit with? That was like, we were essentially coming into someone else's safe space. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't just, you know, crossing that line. It was getting people to accept us and allow us into that space. And I wanna clarify something too, um, cause I, I try to be mindful of the listeners uh, perspective as they hear certain things because Adam you said it was intentional mm -hmm. and I want to clarify that it was not intentional in terms of saying hey guys let's set out on a mission to go to these different areas um, just for the sake of shifting the paradigm of the prison it was almost unintentional an unintentional need right so let, let me draw a picture for you. 
if we're coming from a classroom after either being in class or teaching a class or coming from um, the rec yard where we're working out in one of Adam's uh, high intensity interval training classes or wherever we're coming from and we're together and we're spending quality time together because we had at this point developed a brotherhood. And then we walk into the childhood. Could you imagine walking into a restaurant with your family members, right? And then once you get in the restaurant and you go up to the counter to order, then you all got to separate and sit in different places. That's how it was set up. And so when the three of us walked into the chow hall together, it was almost like, a, a, I almost sort of can remember some of the first moments that we did do that. We did walk into the chow hall and we get our plates and you can almost see us all kind of peek at each other, but we almost dejectedly knew we had, I had to go eat over in the Baltimore section and uh, Arturo went over with the Mexicans and Adam went over with the white guys. But then after a, a little while of that discomfort, like it just wasn't acceptable anymore. We wanted to break bread together. You know, we were a family. And so when we walked into the chow hall, we wanted to eat together. And so then it did sort of become an intentional need because it was almost like, you know, man, where are we going to sit today? And I think we started off trying to determine which was the softest target, you know? Um, and so uh, I think that, I almost want to say that maybe the Baltimore section because uh, the guys from Baltimore loved Cantu and Adam so much anyway, and they were such an uh, uh, integral part of who I was that it was kind of easy to go over there. But then even at, uh, Cantu, who was very eclectic and real playful, he kind of knew some of the, the, the streets and neighborhoods in Baltimore. He would ask me, like, tell me a neighborhood. I might say, like, Emerson Avenue. And so he would come sit at the table, and as soon as somebody would give him a weird look, he would respond with with uh, uh, with, with jokes, you know, um, and, and humor. And he'd be like, what you looking at me like that for, bro? I'm from Emerson Avenue. You know, and everybody at the table, you know, all the black guys would just bust out laughing that this little Mexican guy had the nerve to say something about Emerson Avenue. So we, we it was intentional, but it was intentional based upon a need, not just a, a, a un defined mission that we set out on uh, because some of what Adam has said, we in the process of developing and working on development and having conversations around development, we wanted to talk that all the time. We wanted to be engaged in who we were and who we were becoming all the time. And a lot of times when we separated from each other and went in a certain and just went to our geographical or our racial areas, those kind of conversations did not ensue. And so in order to feed ourselves in the child hall, it wasn't just the meal that was on the tray, but it was the intellectual meal that we shared with each other. And we needed a safe and sacred space to do that as well. I love that. And just going back to something that you said, Adam, was segregating a prison racially is basically control. Helps Absolutely. Control, I don't want to say population control, but control the population. That's what it is. Right? But in my opinion, from the outside looking in, when the three of you blurred those lines and kind of got the respect that you earned through time doing this, I believe you had better control as a unit, all three races, than everybody being so segregated. So can, and you could agree or disagree, but can you guys speak to that a little bit? Can too, you wanna hop in? Yeah, I can. Um... But that, that is kind of, you know, just uh, kind of just backing up a little bit. That is what it was, right? It was population control to the fact that if, if there's too many of one race on a, of a prison compound, they move them, right? They, they keep you uh, from not transferring because of, of population control. And, and it really is that, that systematically their way of, of controlling race and population. Um, yeah, <laughs> for the three of us, I think it was... Um, you know, I'm kind of still stuck on what Keith was saying in that it, it wasn't, uh, it was intentional, but it was, it was, it was out of a need. Right. But it was, it was, and I'm, I might be getting off track here, but I just want to touch on this briefly, just because, you know, it was, it's not a need that was just for us three. There was others as well that wanted that too. And I think that's why it was so welcomed, right? Because it, it was everybody and at this particular time that we were kind of sitting at the different areas, right, was was welcoming us. And it did start at the Baltimore section, but at the end of, of our time together there, it was, everybody was 
I'm, a, I'm not going to say openly kind of inviting us, but you would, you would see the looks like, hey, are they going to sit with us today? Because they wanted that, that intellectual food too. Everybody was in search of what, what was bringing us joy. And the joy that, that we were experiencing was, was contagious, you know, and everybody wanted a piece of that and wanted to figure out, well, dang, how, how can he be living such a high quality of life and be so happy and smiley and jokingly uh, kind of going about his day? while incarcerated and he's been incarcerated for you know adam at that point 20 years i uh, me i'm working out about 13 14 there and keith you know kind of pushing uh, over the the five to year i think it's maybe six i don't remember what year exactly keith was in at that point but you know it, it was kind of it was interesting just to to kind of reflect back on what keith was saying is and, and relive that right if if we if you will right and and watching everyone I, I could vividly kind of see faces uh, <laughs> looking at us and, and smiling and, and kind of wanting us to join them and, and give them uh, every, a little bit of what they were looking for. But, um, you know, me in my bouncing the ball, right? I, I kind of lost track of what you initially asked, uh, Roke. If so be a question for me, please. That's okay. I'm the one, same exact way. I throw the ball and I'll be in the opposite direction. I asked, and maybe I should word it a little bit differently because I don't want it to come across the wrong way by any means, but Adam said earlier that by racially segregating prisons, it kind of offers that control of the population. But yeah. from my perspective, you guys, when you blurred those lines and you earned that respect, had more control. And I don't want to say you guys controlled a compound. That's where I kind of want to clarify, but you were able to squash situations. You were able to, like you just said, make people know that it's okay to be friends with the black guy if you're white go go hang out with the guys from baltimore if you're not from there so i don't know if you agree or disagree with me saying that but if you want to speak to that a little bit and maybe you just did by saying what you said oh no yeah i definitely want to speak to that just because you, some of the um i guess administ not administration but the kind of the line workers right the the correction officers didn't like it neither um, mainly because it confuses them as well, right? They it, it, it makes them kind of try to figure out, okay, hang on a second, what's going on here? They're, these people aren't supposed to be inter, are intermingling. Are, are there something going on? You know, it, it really, it kind of, it confused them. But um, at the end of the day, yeah, it did allow us to to kind of maneuver through some, some high tension sort of situations specifically the one uh, Keith was talking about I'm not, I was just thinking about that it's funny he brought it up I was thinking about that earlier today in that how I'm not, I'm not sure how it came about uh, about what was the reasoning that it, it that that started it um and what it derived in but it, I, I remember somehow we got to the gym and I'm not sure if we were let out we were locked down let out I, I've, I've been through so many different lockdowns and let outs and let uh, uh, let them come out and talk kind of situations, right? And sometimes that's what prisons do after a situation, right? They'll lock you down for a few days and then they'll slowly let you out just to, so that the prisoners can have conversations to kind of figure out what's gonna happen, uh, the next steps and, and how it's gonna move forward. But I remember being in the gym and and it was segregated there. So, and, and I'm not, I might be mixing stories, but at the end of the day, I remember us kind of just me, Keith, and and Adam just, you know, just were like walking through everybody and talking with everybody. And and somebody made mention to me about this because uh, I had a conversation with a an old uh, GED student that I had when uh, when I was tutoring at, at McKean. He mentioned to me, he's like, "Man, you remember when when we were gonna uh, in, we were gonna rumble and there was this whole big uh, <laughs> big thing going on and you were you no, know, I was trying to explain someone to." Uh, explain you to someone and they didn't know who you were but as soon as I told them you were that little Mexican guy running in and out of everybody saying hi when everybody wanted to fight you were just out there talking to everybody <laughs> it uh it, it reminded them of who I was right and and I, I say all that to say that you know back to to your your point and yeah it did give us control not any control that we you know kind of could could use at our discretion right but it did allow us to defuse some situations allow us to be a little safer and, and allow us to kind of maneuver through the, the daily kind of uh, tension that sometimes arised uh, within the situations in, in prison. I think there's a word that comes to my mind in place of control would be influence. Mm. Yeah. 
And I would say between the three of us, that part over time, you know, once we saw how people responded to us, uh, the three of us, you know, always being together. And honestly, I can't tell you how many people like from a distance, you know, like saw us from a distance and were like drawn to us, attracted to us. And we're like, man, like they wanted to be around that energy, exactly what Cantu was saying. Like they needed permission to do things differently. And the way that we were living allowed people that permission to, to see that, man, you could do it differently. And the three of us were, I should clarify this, were very, very visible on that compound because first and foremost, we were at admissions and orientation, which every two weeks a bus comes in. And when they get off that bus, they have to spend a day in the chapel listening to all the administrators and to us. We got an opportunity to speak to them, to engage with them, and to really tell them, hey man, things are different at this facility and we're here to help you, we're here to support you. And people would come in, they'd be like, what? Oh, this is, no, nah, this is too much, man. These guys are crazy. But before you know it, like they're coming around and they wanna be involved in the classes. They wanna spend more time with us. So us then having classes that were always running were an opportunity for these individuals to come and spend more time with us and others who were doing and thinking the same way. And over the course of what, a year, two years of doing this all the time, being at rec together, being in classes together at a o in the dining hall, sitting together, like, that created a cultural shift across the population to where you didn't have many of those issues that were coming up before where, you know, like the hard lines were drawn between one group to another because so many different people were suddenly communicating with one another. And so it wasn't just like, we weren't the ones that bridged every single gap across the community but we did give other people permission to be similar, you know, people to go in between. Like when they saw us doing it, other people started doing similarly, maybe not to the same extent, but that really uh, on a larger scale, us modeling that all the time helped to transform that culture. Yeah, I, I wanna touch on a, a thought and it's funny, I like, um... I don't even think it's intentional, and it may be. I think it's on a subconscious level, but we're going in order. I like that. That's cool. <laughs> but I think that the three of us have been in so many different forums that we almost naturally know how to, we fall right into a system of flowing with each other. And speaking of that, I want to I want to be clear on something. The segregation in and of itself, though it is systematic, and though the system promotes it because the more they can divide and conquer some of those old adages and basic concepts, you keep everyone divided and segregated, it's easier to control them. And a lot of times, um, if you generate conflict amongst them, you keep their minds so distracted on self-improvement because self-improvement speaks against recidivism. Self-improvement speaks against the continuum and the continuation of a multi-billion dollar system. So if I could keep you focused on either watching television, fighting over televisions, fighting over a table to sit at, disputing with one another for racial reasons, then you look up and 10, 20, 30 years have gone by and you've done nothing to improve yourself. So you walk out the door, you're, you're scared and you don't know how to survive. And so you go back to your old survival tactics of selling drugs or doing whatever it is that landed you in prison. And then you just, they, it's a model that is sustainable as long as we're separated, right? And so I think about the bus coming in um, every week and the the model that they have they have this little teeny room it's 40 men on every bus they have a room that's probably by fire marshal standard is made for the capacity of about 10 to 12 people well they almost have a cattle prod that they shove all 40 men of all different races into this room almost 
pushing, he's squeezing there. And he got guys standing on benches and squeezing on toilets to try to fit in his room. They make it such an uncomfortable experience, right? Coming into that first entry point of prison that by the time they dress you and give you a bag and a bedroll and all these things and release you to this almost um, college campus looking um, prison complex, you feel a sense of relief. You're almost happy to be in prison. But along with that happiness, right, as you're walking up this hill, then there's this sense of anxiety. And so that anxiety is rooted in the unknown. And so you're approaching this big compound and you're walking up this walkway and you're going to the unit that's written on the side of your bag and you find a unit and you walk in. And then there's a welcoming committee of people who look just like you. And Cantu walks in and it's a whole crew of Mexicans basically saying, hey, partner, where you from? You know, and the white guys are like, hey, you, hey, come on over here. What you need? We, we got toothbrush, toothpaste, cosmetics. We got some food for you. It almost comforts you. So some of the segregation is actually rooted in love, believe it or not, mm-hmm. right? From our perspective, even though from the system's perspective, it's designed to keep us segregated. So there's so many different psychological dynamics that are taking place here. And so then also the prison politics is really rooted in peace, believe it or not. Because oftentimes there's rules in the prison, like, a, you know, a hands off rule. Right. So that if Adam and I get into a conflict with one another, there's this implied rule that we're really not allowed to put our hands on one another unless our rep- my representative talks to his representative first and tries to diplomatically talk this thing out so that it doesn't become a big issue and a whole lot of people don't get hurt. So there's really some 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 political science involved in how the segregation takes place um, that's kind of ingenious by our dynamic of being able to function on a political level like that. But essentially, when you look at the heart of it, it's still rooted in keeping us segregated and separated and focused on everything but self-improvement. Um, so I, 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 I'm not scared of the word control, right? Uh, I do like the word influence, Adam, because it has a softer and more acceptable touch to it. It feels a little warmer, right? But we had a sense of control. We, we, we had so much fucking control. Excuse my French, but I have to say, and I apologize to any soft or virgin ears, right? We had so much control that we shifted the whole culture of a prison. We had people in there who were fighting almost to get in line, to get in class, to learn something, to be a better person so that they wouldn't come back to prison. Yeah, we had some control because of the, the unity that the three of us showed. And listen, a soft person, a weak person, a weak-minded person could not have done what we did. Somebody without influence, like Adam said, could not have done, would not have survived trying to do what we did. And it scared people. <laughs> My drop moment right now. I mean, where do I even go from there? I think you guys just summarized this whole thing beautifully. So what have I what have I not asked that you feel a burning sensation that you want to include in this video for people who are watching? That's a powerful question. No, I, I think I'll just kind of chime in in that you know, despite I guess the racial sort of uh, segregation uh, that takes place in prison. Um, there are, and, and I'm just, I'm going back to an experience where, you know, uh, USP Atwater, the, the California prison I was in, uh, maximum security, that's the one I spoke about earlier, where it had the segregated lines. And just to give some of the viewers comfort in, in that, you know, there, even though there was segregation, it, it's, um, there is, uh, I guess, an ability for a person who is um, doing the right things and trying to improve themselves to, to do that, right? Even though there wasn't uh, the, the type of programming at the, the maximum security prison as there was at, the, at McKean in, in the medium security, there, if there is a, a desire to improve and become a better person for your family and for yourself, uh, there is an opportunity to do that uh, despite um, not having the, um, the environment that we had um, for, for the number of years that we had. But at the same time, uh, just, just to give some, some viewers uh, a little bit of perspective, no matter where you are, right? If, you, if you're doing the right things, you, you, you know, kind of making sure you're heading in the right direction for, your, for a better future, um, you can do that. So I just wanted to add that, I think. 
So before you move on to the next person, what would you suggest would be the number one thing? Because you guys, you said it perfectly. You guys had it really unique and that doesn't exist anywhere that we're aware of anymore. So what was the number one tool prior to McKean that helped you or that you could pass along to somebody who does want to take your advice and change? I think it's the it, it's the one thing I think we all kind of agree on that that is the equalizer, right? In, in, in educating oneself, right? Um, being able to to kind of um, improve on all levels educationally and and physically and mentally, spiritually, the, the holistic approach. Uh, of course, I didn't learn that until I got to McKean, but at the end of the day, you know, those were just some of the things that I had implemented throughout my, uh, I guess, my journey prior to McKean. But yeah, um, I think if you surround yourself with like-minded people, you know, being, you know, that we want to further our education, you know, kind of explore what our our possibilities are intellectually. I think when you're doing that, no matter where you're at, you, you'll find people you, that you'll, you'll gravitate to. And of um, course, that, that like-minded sort of um, dynamic helps helps you, uh, I guess, just live a little bit more comfortably within, within a, I guess, a higher security or any sort of security, I guess. It, it just helps a little bit. So helpful. Thank you. If you want to go or you want me to go again? I'll go to the first question, anything that I'm burning to share. I, you know what? I, I just want to say thank you um, because I appreciate this opportunity because I think this evening uh, I have maybe for the first time since I've been free, really had a moment to sit and reflect on that experience. And in all honesty, we could probably sit here for 20 hours with narrative, narrative, narrative about that experience and would never for one moment bore the listening audience because we went through so much. And the issue of race was at the center of it for a lot of reasons. Even when I think back to Professor Gaskew and you know, that was his tool to instigate and agitate and create conversation a lot of times. And in that arena, we used to explore uh, race and politics, even in the prison system. Um, but all in all, I think that our friendship sustained us in that environment. Um, and even, uh, you know, Ro, as much as um, you were central in Adam's life, uh, there was a, a moment when the phone went off and the mailbag closed and the email shut down and he had to be in prison 100%. So he didn't even have you as a moment of escape from that experience, but we, ha we had each other. Um, and Black, Mexican, and white, uh, these two guys were the ones that I knew no matter what. They had my back, they had my best interests at heart, and they were gonna help me to be the best possible version of myself so that we could be sitting here in freedom together knowing that um, we would never even have to consider whether or not we're going back to prison, but better yet, we would be contemplating how to move forward and be the, the, the greatest that we could possibly be out here. I always go back to from the first uh, few times that the three of us really spent together. Actually, the first time, the very first time, coming back to where we started, when Cantu and I uh, sat down with Keith, and Keith shared with us his personal situation and why he wanted to be involved in what we were doing, and his authenticity, his passion, like both Cantu and I were so moved by it. And we just kind of looked at each other like, man, this is somebody that like <laughs> we need to spend more time with. Like I want to be around. And I felt that every day with the two of them. Like I wanted, when I got up in the morning, I was like, man, what are we going to do today? And, you know, when I had to go back to my housing unit for count, I was like, when are we going to meet back up again? Am I going to see them tonight? We would carve out space, get a classroom down in education so that we could spend even more time together. Like this wasn't just, you know, a here and there where, where it was, 
you know, we'd see each other in passing. Like I wanted to be around these guys as much as possible. I knew that being around them was making me a better person as a result. And, you know, it was the conversations, it was the mental stimulation, it was the emotional support. It was all of those things. And in seeing what it did for the three of us, you know, created for me, I found my purpose in wanting to share that with others to make sure that other individuals who found themselves, you know, in a similar situation, wherever they were incarcerated, that they would have that same sense of support, belonging, uh, you know, a sense of accountability, all of the things that made me into the person that I am today. And since then, you know, since the three of us, you know, were separated, I've given so much time and energy to thinking about this because man, the impact that it had on my life, that it had on all of our lives, like that's, you know, I always knew that this day would be here. I always believed that we would be having this conversation. <laughs> and I know you guys can attest to it. I mean, like we had this conversation years ago about being here, you know, connecting, following through on all the dreams and aspirations that we had. And that's not something that I ever experienced previously, not in any aspect of my life. Like I didn't have people like that. And so it was through these relationships, these friendships that taught me what I wanted in my life. And it's gotten me to commit to making sure that going forward, I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to make sure that others have the opportunity to create those same relationships, to create that same safe, sacred space while they're incarcerated so that they can become, you know, those best versions of themselves and that they have these lifelong relationships that I feel so fortunate to have. I love that. And as you guys were talking, I was getting emotional and you basically read my mind. So thank you. So I can try to close this out without getting emotional on video, but it's probably not going to happen. This was the very first time that I got to see the three of you and your dynamic in the free world. And I can't thank all three of you and you guys, my brothers, enough because you've given me the life that I have today, the life that I always dreamed about. You helped me not feel so anxious while he was inside. I knew he had you guys. And without being any more sappy than I'm already being right now, everybody needs an Adam Keith and Cantu in their life. So thank you guys for doing this. Thank you so much for being here. And I think we're done. Yeah, thanks for making me cry too, bro. Appreciate uh, it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna stop recording unless anybody wants to say anything else on video. Mm, now good.